Happy Monday to all of our viewers out there. Uh, we're super excited to see all of you here again today. And welcome to another installment of On.NET Live, where our mission is to empower you, the .NET community, to achieve more. I'm your host, Scott Addy, and I'm joined today with co-hosts Myra Wenzel and David Pine. Hello. Today's guest is Tim Purdom, um, who will talk to all y'all about mapping an open source library, mapping with an open source library called GeoBlazer. Perhaps you've heard of it. Uh, Tim, let's have you briefly introduce yourself to the audience. All right. Thanks, Scott. Uh, pleasure being here. My name's Tim Purdom, as Scott said. Um, this is, I'm a .NET developer, uh, but this is my second career. I was a music teacher for much of my adult life. And uh, yeah, I see all your records in the background there. David, that's <laughs> awesome. Um, and so I'm a self-taught dev, like a lot of people. And I found .NET, you know, while looking for kind of the, the one-stop shop of, you know, cross-platform development. And, and then I got into ASP.NET Core and really love, you know, everything about web development and Blazor is kind of my passion these days. So, that's me. I also, I guess my technical title is uh, engineering manager at my company, Dymaptic. Um, and so then, you know, I get to use some of those teaching skills along with the <laughs> with the coding skills. Thanks, Tim. It's always cool to hear folks coming from that non-traditional background and being successful, especially in the, the .NET ecosystem. Uh, yeah. With that, uh, David, I know you have a related bit stock you wanted to share today. Should we move into that? Let's do it. Awesome. So I believe there's my screen. Let's press buttons and hope for the best. OK. Uh, so the related bits content that we're going to cover for this is ASP.NET Core Blazor, JavaScript interoperability, also known as JS interop, uh, more simply. Um, but this this content here explains like the overarching concepts behind interacting with JavaScript from Blazor apps. And you know, one of the earlier promises of Blazor was that you know it de-emphasizes the amount of JavaScript that you would need to use. However, there are certainly use cases for JavaScript, uh, and how you use JavaScript from Blazor is through uh, interop. So. Uh, you can call JavaScript functions from .NET, and you can also have uh, .NET methods that are called either statically or from component references from JavaScript itself. Uh, so this is the article here scrolling across the bottom of your screen. I encourage you to check it out. It goes into uh, details on some of the concepts. And this is just a, a related bit portion that will certainly correspond to what Tim's about to show us with GeoMaps and GeoBlazor and all that fun stuff. So that's pretty much it for the related bits section. 
Good stuff. I guess one for the viewers out there, uh, mm -hmm. David, who are wondering when might this be applicable in the real world? Do you have any thoughts on that? When when might JS interop become a thing you'd want to do? Certainly. Yeah. If ever there's a library that exists that's uh, utilitarian, for example, uh, such as the geomapping library. I'm not familiar with the actual name. Tim might correct me on that. Uh, but there's certain libraries that exist out there. Uh, that you may want to use rather than trying to re-implement all of it yourself. Um, and you can do so by simply using JS Interop. So there's there's lots of various use cases for it, um, as we will see for the hallway track. All right. Now this is the fun part of the show, right? We're, we're past the related bits, we're past the introductions, and now this is where we encourage all of our live viewers to ask questions to our uh, subject matter expert, our beloved guest, Tim, today. And uh, I'm certainly looking forward to this. Um, I, I had a chance to look a little bit behind the curtains, uh, Tim, and I think what you guys are doing is really cool. So um, would you like us to share your screen? Sure, yeah, go ahead. I think I'm ready for it. Let's do it. <laughs> uh, I don't have a huge slideshow or anything ready, but uh, I do have a couple slides, and then I'll just be sharing my browser and you know some code and some samples and, and stuff like that. Um, before I get really into GeoBlazer, I did want to talk on your tip there, David, just a little bit. This morning um, on our Dimaptic blog, I posted uh, a new blog post about exactly using exactly this using JS Interop uh, for a non-mapping thing. I I used Quill.js, which is a just a text editor, as an example of how you could just quickly wrap that in a JS interop and you know a single Razor component, and then use that from Blazor. So yeah, there's lots of examples like that. To Scott's question, where you know why reinvent the idea of a text editor in the web when Quill and uh, what's the other one, Tiny MCE, and there's all those other ones out there, you know, that have already been tested and and you know we know they work well so we just have to write a little thin wrapper around that to make it work with blazer um and geoblazer is kind of the same idea here so um let's see this first slide just my name and the company named dimaptic we are a gis company um, a small company women owned uh, we have developers all over the country and actually our ceo is in europe at the moment um, and we work for lots of uh, government agencies, small go small government, um, and you know, nonprofits, large corporations. It, it really varies, but we do a lot of contract work for different groups using GIS uh, data, which of course is geospatial information systems uh, mapping for those of us who are less familiar with it. But of course, there's other ways to use the data besides just in a map. You answer my first question, which is like, what was JS for those that right. I don't are not familiar with the acronym? Awesome. Yes, uh, Geospatial Information Systems. I believe that's correct. Um, it's still fairly new to me. Uh, I learned all about this as I came on with Dimaptic, uh, and I was doing other .NET work. You know, more just basic forms on you know in a web browser or on a Windows app before that. Uh, but yeah, it's all the different ways you can use data that has a location tag to it like lat long or you know some other way of tagging the location uh and then so i put geoblazer.com there this uh what do they call this the qr code mm -hmm. will take you to geoblazer.com um and then i'm i've moved off twitter and onto mastodon and i know uh, some of you i think david's been on there um and so there's my tag if you want to find me on Mastodon. Uh, so GeoBlazer is a wrapper around ArcGIS. ArcGIS is a big, um, it's been around for 30 years or something. Uh, it's a big GIS suite of tools. It's kind of like the enterprise tool, like, you know, if you compared Microsoft Office to Google Docs, say, Office is obviously the more enterprise and, you know, more business focused 
offering there. And ArcGIS is kind of the same thing. It's it's like the the enterprise uh, mapping solution that again, lots of government agencies, large corporations, nonprofits all use. And when I came on at Dimaptic last year, they took me to the Esri Dev Summit. Esri is the company that makes ArcGIS. And they, and I noticed when I got there that there were lots of .NET things, but they were all desktop based. Um, ArcGIS Pro is a desktop application written in .NET. Um, and then they have like uh, an SDK that you can use with um, Xamarin. I think they've got it out for Maui now, but it was you know lagging just a little bit behind the actual release of Maui. And uh, you know, so they have cross-platform and all that. But then from the website, it was all about their JavaScript API that you could call into and do things with. And so of course, being somebody who's fallen in love with Blazor, my immediate thought was, well, I want to use <laughs> both of these. I want to use .NET, but I want to use it in the web. And it seems like a perfect fit for that community because there's a lot of, like I said, .NET developers who already use ArcGIS, but don't use it on the web. So um, I thought it was a good fit there. And I immediately started like, you know, mocking out some things right there at the conference. And uh, that's what became GeoBlazer. So basically, we've taken and remodeled all of the components of ArcGIS in Razor components. And then you can call right into those and not have to reference the JavaScript <clears throat> directly. And, you know, modeling not just the objects, but the methods and all of that. Uh, the funny thing to me is, you know, when you do this JS interop work like this of wrapping a library, your goal is to use less JavaScript, but to get there, you have to write a lot of JavaScript, <laughs> um, to, especially for a complex library like ArcGIS. It's, it's not something that's a simple wrapper around it. So I have a, a question. Maybe some of our viewers are wondering the same thing, Tim. Uh, you mentioned ArcGIS several times. And as I'm looking at their page, I noticed there's a, it appears to be a licensing cost per year. Is right. there any cost associated with using what you've developed? Right. So uh, GeoBlazer itself is open source and is free, mm -hmm. free to use. Um, I believe it's MIT license. Uh, but yes, the underlying uh, ArcGIS, there's a free developer account. And then it's kind of like Azure or AWS or something like that, where it's a per use fee. And they have a pretty significant free <clears throat> tier. So there's a lot of things you can do for free with it. There's also ways you can use GeoBlazer where you're not even hitting these uh, paid endpoints. Because basically what they're charging you for is um, accessing things that are on their server, like web maps that are already on there or feature layers of data. And if you build all of that kind of locally in your own application, and you can even <clears throat> use like an open street maps, which is a, a open source alternative to ArcGIS. You can use an open street map layer and add your own graphics to it and do all that. And you won't even hit these, these prices or, or these endpoints that actually charge. So yeah, so it's the <laughs> ArcGIS is not free. Uh, there are fees associated with it, but it's it's very easy to get started. And I think it's very reasonable, the fees, if you do want to use one of their services. Cool. We do have a couple of questions coming in. One uh, from yeah. Split Software, and they're saying, is this like Mapbox or React leaflets? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> I, I need to read up on some of those. Uh, I think those both are more open source and they wouldn't tie into ArcGIS. Okay. So good and bad, you know, you would have kind of the completely free uh, path with those, but you would not have the power of ArcGIS, which like I said, has been built over 30 years of, of a lot of sure. enterprise development. Interesting. Um, and then we've got another question coming in from Mert who says uh, they'd love to basically see 
a geolocation app for monitoring earthquakes. So that's certainly a valid use case. And I think there's like an alerting system that might already exist, but to take that specific coordinates and then, um, you know, plot it on a map, that could be really compelling. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, there's, I haven't, since GeoBlazer is so new, we haven't had a whole lot of implementations with it yet. Mm -hmm. um, and we're really just getting rolling. I think the version one that I deployed to NuGet was in July. And I'm actually working on version 2.0, a beta release right now. Um, absolutely, that's something that you can do. That's something that, you know, my company might look into this week now that we've heard about the, you know, the earthquake. And uh, sure. yeah. That, cool. Yeah, more, more cool. questions are coming in. Yeah, go ahead, Myra. Yeah, so can GeoBlazer be used with PostGIS? Is that um, another... Yeah, so PostGIS, I believe it, that's the Postgres uh, database implementation with GIS. Um, so a lot of this is things that we can build into GeoBlazer, but they wouldn't be there today. Um, you could certainly query PostGIS yourself if in C Sharp and then create your, say, your graphics, your, your features from that data and then put them into GeoBlazer. Uh, that would, but it wouldn't just query it automatically and, and put that all together for you. There would be some, you know, some glue work that you'd have to do there. Um, I see uh, Christopher is our CTO and has been a, a big help with GeoBlazer and he's answering some questions in there <laughs> as we go as well. So thanks Christopher for being on there. Um, so, Let's see, I'll, I'll just go through some other bits about GeoBlazer and then we can answer some more questions here. Uh, basically, I started this by looking at the ArcGIS JavaScript APIs website here and you know, just saying, okay, what are some things I can do with this? Like I said, I was at the conference, I'm writing it. And so I went, okay, let's do the samples, the tutorials. And how do I display a map? Okay. And then I took the JavaScript and then I created something very similar. It's gonna take a minute to load there. There it is. Um, and I put it into GeoBlazer. So you'll see a lot of these pages, I have a different base map here. There's some cool like hand-drawn, it looks like hand-drawn base maps. I think this one says something about crayons. Um, and, you know, then I just played around with, okay, can I change the latitude and longitude and the zoom and the rotation all from, from C sharp. So actually on each of these pages, there's also source code that you can just look at and you can see here's those little latitude, longitude inputs, and then there's the map itself. It's not very much, you know, you set a class on it, or you can set, you know, a style just like just in CSS, latitude, longitude, zoom, rotation, and then you just create a map and a base map. And so GIS, ArcGIS has a, this idea of base maps, and then layers, feature layers or graphic layers that you can layer on top of that. So whenever you see like a, a marker on a map, that's probably in either a feature layer or a graphic layer. Um, but the base map itself is simply, you know, kind of pre-drawn. So is there like an API key um, that would be required or like what's the minimal viable, like if I just want to like take the mapping component and drop it into an existing Blazor app, yeah. what's, yeah. what is that? So like? uh, the, the best way to get started is to find docs.geoblazor.com and this getting started page. There's a little video walkthrough, but I'll skip that since we're already on a video. Um, yes, so you need an API key from ArcGIS. So again, that developer, that free developer account, you go in there and so you're signed in and you go to API keys and you can just create one. You can uh, write limits around it saying, I only want this to work from this you know, URL. Uh, so I have ones that are for local testing 
and then also ones that I'm using for deployed applications so that I can really limit that scope of them. Uh, the one tricky thing, I'm sure anyone who's familiar with JavaScript or web development is aware of this, yep. is it's <laughs> it's hard to use API keys and and uh, obscure them because of course you're, develop, you're delivering everything to the end user. So using things like refers and like that is is important. Of course, if you do Blazor server, then all of that can stay on the server kind of, and, and it doesn't really get exposed as much. Um, so yes, you need an API key. And then I have kind of a starter app that I just built this morning. And so I'll walk you through real quick. The dead simple thing, but not super secure thing is to put create an app settings. Uh, this is Blazor Wasm. Uh, in the WW root folder, paste your code in there. I'll delete this key after the show so that nobody can steal it. But um, you paste your code in there at, with this key name, and it'll just pick it up, and it'll just run with it. Uh, the other things you need to set up, you have to add these two lines to the header, and you can actually choose dark theme or light theme from the Esri themes. And let's see, you need to add some using statements. Of course, your IDE may, you know, prompt you to do that anyways, if you start putting in the web map without those. And then in the program file, there's one line, and actually you don't even need this for the basic implementation, but this there are some, some features that are inside this add geoblazer tag. So you can add that right in. Uh, let's see if I forgot anything. I think those are the main things. So then you just you know open up a page and you start implementing a map view. You always need a view and a map. Uh, and they also have scenes. So a scene is a three-dimensional map. Um, so and then you can, if it's a web map, you can kind of load it from an ID, which is it's kind of like loading it from a URL, or you can just define your own map and create your own content on it, like a feature layer and, or actually a graphics layer is even better for creating something on the, on your own server. And then you would just create a graphic and you would say, all right, in this graphic, I want to have a polygon or a point. And for a point, I could say the latitude and the longitude. Uh, and I could say that that graphic also has a symbol and we'll call it the simple marker symbol. And we'll give it a color. And so you can see that I, I've got it all mapped out in a way that it, it works as razor components. Um, this is this is kind of a hack to Blazor because each of those components is not actually rendering HTML. It's instead creating instructions that I pass to the JavaScript. Um, and so... They, because otherwise, it, if you were using the, the JavaScript library straightforward, you would have to do JavaScript commands instead of doing the, the markup exactly. like you're doing. Yes, here. the ArcGIS JavaScript API does not have, uh, let's see if I can, it does not have any like templating like that in, in HTML. So you can see, let's see if I get down here to create a map and mm -hmm. you can see that they're really just doing it all in code, right? They, here's the map and then here's the view and so it's the, I wanted to make it more visual and more HTML web uh, razor component based, markup based when, when I did this wrapper so that people could kind of quickly get started with just laying things out. That's great, I love it. It's more than just like not using JavaScript from your code, it's like more straightforward. With the right, and you definitely can still create things in C sharp as well. 
Um, mm -hmm. It's something I'm working on in this version two. So version one that we put out this summer was very much about these kind of static displays. I mean, you could still drag things around. You can add widgets to a map and all of that. But uh, what I learned after deploying that was that a lot of people have these use cases where they really need to update that data, right? They really need to track a moving graphic or or something like that. And so that's what we're working on right now is a lot of that uh, updating and a lot of the JavaScript interop is quite complicated uh, with serialization issues um, and you know the the kind of that round trip and making sure if I take this from C sharp and give it to JavaScript and and ArcGIS and get it back to C sharp is it still the same object and can I still identify it as the same graphic or whatever. And when you say that you launched this summer, this last summer, is it is it summer uh, on the northern hemisphere? So last July, August. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good point. It was July. Because I, I know we have some right. some friends from southern hemisphere here, and so it's like, oh, now it's summer. So. Yes. Thank you for clarifying. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. No. No. <laughs> to no. Just good. take that for for granted. But you're absolutely right. It, it was just about six months ago, seven months okay, ago awesome. that we released. Yeah. So is there is your intent to have like full feature parity with the underlying Arc GIS? That's obviously the goal. I, I think the goal is more <laughs> than feature parity. Um, you know, the doing things like this wrapping in in components and adding our own widgets on top of things where, you know, there's this specialized widget that does this, you know, will let you, I don't know, automatically drag and drop a specific icon onto it. Um, Christopher and I have even talked about uh, having kind of a, a WYSIWYG editor where you could create maps in GeoBlazor and then just deploy a new application by dragging and dropping. And behind the scenes, it's it's using and creating Razor components, but the the developer experience would be more of this low code idea. So we have lots of ideas around that. Um, feature parity is tough. Uh, ArcGIS is huge and it has a lot of features in it. And so we're, we're really, we had a lot of conversations this year around like the 90% use mm -hmm. case, you know, what is actually used by most developers. And then, you know, we're always open to feedback on that as well. We have a discord channel that we've had uh, several community members joining in and giving feedback and, and testing things out for us. So, um, you know, we're really trying to see you know, feature parity would be wonderful, but it's also a free product and it sure. doesn't right now pay the bills. So yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think one um, thing that I, I would say as a community member myself that is um, appreciated is when there's like a, I know it's free, but you still have to sign up and have an, an ArcJ or C, G, GIS backed account. Um, but it seemed as though you were familiar with some of the stuff that doesn't require that per se. And like even omitting like the services that add GeoBlazor, it'd be cool to just maybe have like a light version of it that if I just want to map and I already know the coordinates, and I just want to, you know, have a component to, to splat that on the screen. Um, that that's at least a way to get people even, you know, interested in, in exploring it further too. Right. Yeah, it definitely, you know, I, I do realize that that's kind of a stumbling block for people just getting into it. Um, you know, we, we talked a lot about we have these kind of two distinct potential user bases. One is GIS.net developers who are looking for a web solution, and they already have that ArcGIS account and, you know, all of that. And then there's the other people who are more the focus of a show like this who are just .NET developers who, oh, I need a mapping solution and I need, you know. Um, and so it is a little bit of a, of a hurdle there. There are definitely ways that you can use it without an API key, um, but I would definitely also check in if you're gonna deploy something like that 
look at the fine print because under the the hood we are using Esri's code. We're calling into the right, right, JavaScript right. libraries and everything. So you would want to make sure that you were doing everything, you know, legally in, Correct. in that yeah. sense. So we were talking about feature parity. I have a related question. I have to imagine that the team of folks maintaining GeoBlazor is small. Um, how do you handle uh, the situation where a new ArcGIS product release comes out and there are breaking changes? I don't think we've been around long enough to, <laughs> to really deal with that yet. Um, but that certainly, one thing we would do is uh, we are using a TypeScript build system. Um, I'm actually using ES Build, which is a nice light, you know, builder alternative to something big like Webpack. Uh, and so I can pin the version of the JavaScript, the the ArcGIS JavaScript API. Uh, and so I believe that you know, assuming they don't do something crazy like shut down their old version immediately, which would break lots of their customers. I believe we could just, you know, stay on, I think they're on 4.25. So I could just stay on that when five releases until GeoBlazor is updated and then and then move move that target. That makes sense. Okay. I, I yeah, I suspect that day will come and you will have issues in your repo <laughs> saying, hey, why don't we have feature parity? Why why doesn't this work anymore? Right. Uh, it's a small team. They're volunteering their time. Uh, we're super appreciative of, of that. Yeah, you know, like I said, it kind of started as a just a labor of love for me. I, I, you know, I'm self-taught because I love to code, and and so I really was just putting in weekends on this. And I do have Christopher and a few other folks on our team that are helping and chipping in now. But it it really is that. You know, I wanted to see a product like this exist and and bridge this gap between ArcGIS and web development, and uh, so you know, and I, I put in when I can. <laughs> and I think that? that's no, I think that's how a lot of our open source projects from the community start off um, and become like really great projects with a lot of love behind it and dedication. And so, yeah, thank you, thank you for for doing that. It's it's a labor of love. Yeah, of course. So I'm looking through the chat here. Are there any questions we haven't addressed yet? I see a... Uh, Christopher keeps answering a bunch of them before we get a chance to ask Tim. <laughs> yeah, but I think it would be cool to uh, like to ask some of those so that sure. it's in the recording and also like for folks that are on Twitch or something, um, maybe I'm not seeing Chris answers. So maybe we should grab some of those. Yeah, good point. Yeah, the one of the first questions I see I'll put up on the screen here. Uh, is it possible to use multiple geographic maps at the same box? Any thoughts on that, Tim? I'm trying to think what they mean by box. Probably um, like the map view, the top level. Yeah. Yeah, so it definitely is. I, I mean, there's a couple different things you can do. You certainly could have a web page with multiple map views in it and have different uh, maps inside that. I think I have a sample of it in here somewhere that does that. Um, let's see. But also, yeah, so here's a, a sample of two side by side. Um, they'll take up. You can also, like I said, do the layering. So. I think it would be weird if you had a full map and then you layered it on top of another full map because then you're talking about just covering or some sort of transparency. But with the the feature layers and the graphics layers where it's individual uh, images, polygons, um, you know, lines, points, uh, all of that, you can certainly layer those and you can have as many layers as you want on top of whatever your base map is. So I'm curious, this is kind of a, a deeper technical question, but are these being rendered on a canvas, like an HTML5 canvas element, or is it images that are then manipulated through some sort of styling or how, how does that, like the underlying mechanism work for displaying the map? 
That's a good question. I don't, you know, have to deal with that level right. of it because, <laughs> I'm, because I'm writing a wrapper. Um, right. But I believe they are rendered in on a canvas. Okay. Yeah, I, I I know I've dug into the you know dev tools enough to see that at the root level it is a canvas. Okay. Cool. Um, as keeping with the technical question theme that David started there, uh, Tim, I know in your program CS file you were calling a I service collection extension method add GeoBlazer something. Um, mm -hmm. When would it be necessary to call that? You said it's not necessary all the time. What what sort of features? Right. So we do have. Like? Yeah. No, that's a great question. Um, we do have some things that don't map well to. Razor components. And so, for example, there are these tools in ArcGIS. One is called the Geometry Engine, where you can give it, uh, say, a point and say, create a buffer around this point. So, create a polygon that is a buffer of a certain radius around this one point, and it'll give it back to you. So, that's very much, a, you know, an algorithm, a calculation. It doesn't make sense to have it be a Razor component. Uh, instead, you're just going to call that in code. And so the injection, the automatic injection where that would that geometry engine, there's another one called projection, which will project from one um, a coordinate system to another. And so you can inject those directly into your razor component or just your C sharp class uh, by adding that add geoblazer. Very cool. Uh, we do have another question that came into the chat. I'll put this up on the screen for everyone to see. Um, the question is, does GeoBlazer have map tools such as zooming, uh, move, drawing shapes, et cetera, that can be added or customized? Yes, so this is definitely one of those kind of advanced features that we're trying to decide You know how much we give away for free versus possibly put in, uh, we are going to create a paid extension library that will be on top of the core library. Um, there is, and this is, our extension library is not uh, deployed. It is still in production. Um, but I will give you an example here if I can find it. Um, Got to remember which one it is. By in production, you mean like under development, not not in production like it's available. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, uh, bad word for it. Yes, it's in <laughs> development, not in production. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, here's an example. This is the Esri uh, sketch widget that will let you draw different shapes. And so, you know, we're still de deciding that is not in the free product right now. And uh, we may expose it in the free product. We may keep it in the paid product. Um, like I said, that's still in, in development. And so we don't have a price set or anything. But then we also want to add more ways of doing drawing and more customized tools like that uh, that would be in the paid product. OK. Uh, you had mentioned, you know, adding capabilities like this, which is, of course, a roadmap item. Are there other roadmap items for this library that you could speak to? Things that are off in the near future. Yeah, um, just real quick, I did want to uh, back up, and uh, I'll show you the widgets page. Here. This, these are all included in the free uh, tier, and I believe that Amjad's question asked about some of these as well, like a locator widget, a search widget where you can type an address and, and go to that address, um, a legend, a scale bar, a home widget, a compass, all of that stuff is included. So there is a lot out of the box that you get that you can do navigation. Um, of course, it supports drag and zoom and all of that. Um, to your question about roadmap, I think like I said, we're still so early that the biggest roadmap thing is that 90% feature parity and getting enough in there that people really want to use this. And then to be able to build something where we can um, have extra widgets that you can add and have uh, a deployment strategy. Um, 
one thing that you know we all struggle with as developers is where do I deploy my app? And if you do have an ArcGIS account, there are kind of hosted services that you can use to deploy your applications. Um, so Christopher was looking into a way for people who are already in that ArcGIS world to just, all right, I just want to deploy this with a click of a button and there it goes up. Um, that drag and drop editor that I mentioned earlier, Scott, that would be another uh, roadmap feature, something where we can really make this a low code tool where you can still, you know, we always want to expose the C sharp underneath and, and even the JavaScript, actually, we have, uh, places in the source code and in the samples code where I will demonstrate, okay, this isn't written in GeoBlazer yet, but here's how you dig down into the JavaScript with that JS interop that David was showing and do it yourself until I can get a chance to implement this in, in the core library. And so I've shared that a lot on our Discord channel too. Like, here's what you need to do today because this is not ready to do it directly. Awesome. And we keep getting questions about support for other uh, mapping uh, solutions uh, like GeoServer. Someone was asking about K QGs. Um, I'm not familiar with any of those. But implementing something like that, it would be almost like having to write a whole new wrapper for each one of those solutions, right? Yeah, there's a couple, couple different ways of going about that. Um, Esri actually is trying to make ArcGIS inter interoperable with all of those. So there okay. are actually in the Esri, um, let's see if I go to like the layers here, you can see there's an open street maps layer, which I actually do have implemented in uh, ArcGIS, or I'm sorry, in GeoBlazer. There's a GeoJSON layer, which is just what it sounds like. It's JSON mapping data that you can deserialize into a map. Um, there's, I believe some of these others are based on open Bing maps layer. Um, oh, wow. Interesting. I don't see, I don't see a Google maps layer, but <laughs> um, there's, so there's a lot of those that we can really easily build into this. Mm -hmm. And then there's that idea, Myra, that I would have to kind of start all over uh, to wrap a different under the hood technology. Gotcha. Um, and yeah, that, you know, it might be something we would do in the future, but uh, that would be a much bigger thing to tackle. Yeah. No, but not that makes RGIS sense. With... And replace it with something else. But it's open source, right? And you're accepting pull requests and encourage <laughs> everyone who's watching. <laughs> That's right. I mean, we certainly could create, you know, under the hood, a, a totally separate engine that just ran, you know, a QGIS or uh, I don't, I thought QGIS was desktop, but I, like I said, I'm still new to the area as well. So I've got another question um, with with these mapping layers uh, and it being web. Web has always kind of had, you know, inconsistencies with how they accept user interactions in, in terms of like gestures, like swiping and pinching and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Are you familiar with what GeoBlazer does in terms of that type of support? No, I think, I mean, again, on once you're on the map, you're really in ArcGIS and I don't have to do a whole lot with that. Um, one thing sort of related to that that we haven't talked about yet is uh, we do have like a whole set of event listeners and event handlers so that you can do something custom in your code. So if I click on the map, then I get back, you know, the data about the click point. And if I double click, I get data on that and, you know, this, this hold and drag and blur and focus and all of those, even, even key events. Um, I'm not quite sure why you would use a key event as your, or why you would use your keyboard to navigate a map, but I'm sure there's a reason to do that. Oh, um, absolutely. One of our good friends that was on the show earlier from Split um, is a huge advocate for accessibility. And, right. you know, being an ally is having stuff like that because there's tons of people that actually use the keyboard inputs. Very good point. Yeah, very good point. Um, so, yeah, I guess I, I always think about 
maps being limiting in some sense anyways, because you have to, it's, it's a visual medium um, for accessibility, but definitely the underlying data, there's lots of ways of using it. You're I'm muted, sure. David. Sorry, I was saying it works. I brought it up on my phone and the samples. Nice. Uh, you can pinch. pinch and zoom. You can pinch and yeah, yeah. Awesome. I wanted to go back to this topic of layers. So David asked, you know, is this open source? It is. Now let's say David wants to contribute a new layer, uh, MapQuest layer, let's say, if anybody out there still uses MapQuest. Um, are there docs that would explain <laughs> how to do that, how to contribute a new layer. I assume there are certain, there are very rigorous requirements on how to do that. Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, I believe, I haven't done it myself that much, so I'm gonna kind of shoot from the hip here, Scott, and try to answer that. Um, I know that you could certainly have a layer like the GeoJSON example where it's just data or like loading it yourself from post GIS. And in that case, you could go through, you know, in Blazor in your Razor file, a loop and say, I'm going to create this graphic, I'm going to create this graphic and just, you know, generate it that way in code or and in markup. Um, you can also host layers, and that's kind of how ArcGIS Online and, and a lot of their samples and their base maps and all of that work is you create basically a REST endpoint that serves up all that data. And if it's in the right format, then ArcGIS and GeoBlazor knows how to consume that. And you just give it a URL. In, so you say, I want a feature layer, and here's the URL for it, and it just loads it. Very cool. Are we seeing anything else in the chat that we want to discuss here? Not anything in particular. I do. I've got one very specific question and I keep thinking about this. So like taking a step back and looking holistically, like you've got a beautiful website, you've got a successful 90% feature parity, you know, wrapper around Arc GIS with GeoBlazor and it's really well done, but it's not always rainbows and ponies. So I want to hear from you as one of the key developers on this. What were some of the nightmares that you ran into when developing this? Like what was like, holy crap, this was not fun. You know, yuck. I know JavaScript interops probably at the heart of that, but <laughs> I'd like to hear. Yeah. Um, yes. And serialization is probably the biggest. Um, and it's not just the .NET serialization. It's also um, that. Esri ArcGIS serialization um, because they, you know, have their own whole framework and library and everything. And so they've done some things that make it harder, like a collection that is not just, does not just serialize to an array, but it actually uh, has its own type and it's hard to, to serialize into just an array of items. Um, and you know, then there's system text JSON, which I'm really trying to lean into, but it's still kind of new, and it's still got um, like until .NET seven, it didn't have the um, what, what's it called where you can say the subtypes, the subclasses are deserialized as their subclass rather than just as the root class of Poly whatever polymorphic yeah. hierarchies. There you go, polymorphic, yep. yes. Um, and so GeoBlazor, I'm keeping on .NET 6 for now because we don't want to break anyone who's, who's using it on .NET 6. Uh, I'm sure at some point, just like we were talking about with the JavaScript updating, at some point we'll have to bite that bullet. But um, so I have to write custom JSON converters for pretty much every type in there. I have to write custom equality uh, checks for pretty much every type in there. Uh, so there's a lot of boilerplate in that sense. Um, that seems like an opportunity for source generation. And you may not be aware of this, but actually .NET 7 supports um, system text JSON source generators. So they've got some I, stuff you might want to look at, maybe. Yeah, I definitely need to learn about source generators. <laughs> yeah, I see people talking about it all the time, but I have not 
dug into it yet. We have had a show, I believe, on source generators. Uh, don't recall who the guest was. May have been Jason Bach, but it's been discussed before. Okay, yeah, I'll go back and dig through it. Uh, one thing that, besides source generators, that's helping me with that a lot is Copilot, because if it's boilerplate and it knows what I already started writing up above, it can just fill out the rest of it for me. So you've become like a tab developer, tab, tab, <laughs> yes. tab, yep, yep. Only in those situations where it's really <laughs> obvious. It does a really good job, though. I've been so impressed with it, honestly. Like, I use it yeah. quite a bit. All right. Uh, David, I assume you're responsible for that uh, Jason Stringify call in the, the chat. Yeah, um, yeah, sorry I'm about that. I'm wondering, is there ever a, a legitimate case where was this phone is equal to true? <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yeah. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, if, if it was a string version of false, then, you know, you don't co coerce the types over when you do, you know, double equality versus triple. Yeah, there's there's fun stuff like that in JavaScript. Um, yeah, I was just trying to be silly. Uh, so let's uh, let's you had you had code up before, and you started doing something, and we just got so far away from it. We were just there's like a bazillion questions. Could you go back to the code real quick and like finish? You were starting sure. with like a sample um, uh, sample marker symbol, and you were doing the color, and this was going to be like an actual demo, I assume, right? We're going to look at something here that you're doing. Uh, yeah. In theory, anyways, let's <laughs> never know how it's. Uh, oh, let's see. And of course, I'm using VS Code because I, I figured it was lighter for the. Ah, uh, okay. For the demo, but that does make it. It doesn't like that. Let's see. Um. So yeah, you can set basically any graphic uh, has to have. A geometry, which in this case is the point, and a symbol. What are we going to draw at that point? And so uh, you need to set a color. And I'm not sure why that's not highlighting right, but it could it just be right a right. syntax highlighting yeah. issue with VS yeah. Code and Razor. And uh, you can set a size, I believe, is just like a pixel uh, number. And so then. Of course, I have no idea what I should probably get some real lat longs here um, or figure out where that is. Yeah, 1020. I have no idea where that <laughs> actually. Yeah. If I go, let's see. Oh, here's our whole uh, repository. And there's a, a docs which generates our docs page. There's samples, sources, of course, the actual code. And so, and here I have lots of pages. These are the pages I showed you on the samples, but I could steal some lat long out of one of these. Here, let's just steal that. And then I could say, dude, I just wanted to express my appreciation for leaving the fields and code with the correct, what I consider to be correct naming convention, <laughs> prefixing with the underscore. Because I see so much sample Blazor code where they don't do that. Oh, and man. It reminds me too much of <laughs> JavaScript. It's like, come on. <laughs> David, I believe you recently ran a Twitter poll on this, didn't you? Uh, I don't. Oh, I on something similar. Yeah, another naming convention. Right. Yeah. I was surprised by the results of that one, actually. Yeah, so with with any luck, this should show up. Let's run it. <laughs> yeah, we've got a question here. Is this Blazor? Yeah, so what we're looking at right now was a VS Code, and it was a Blazor mm -hmm. component. And uh, so Blazor is HTML and C Sharp kind of all together. There's a, a, an actual <laughs> Razor view engine that is capable of comprehending both those things together. Um, yes. So I accidentally uh, took away all the base map of this. <laughs> and so what we saw that first time was literally just that my point on a white canvas. <laughs> so, love it. Love it. 
Uh, so let's see, let's just stop this and rerun it. I don't think we get hot reloading. One thing I'm noticing too there is on line number seven, Tim, your latitude and longitude, one has an at symbol, the other one doesn't. I don't uh -huh. think it's necessary yep. for either, but yep, just for consistency. Yeah, those are always tricky, and they changed a couple times when Blazor was first coming out, like where you needed the at sign and where it could infer them. Yeah, so I learned a lot about the Razor View engine with doing some research. Um, it, it depends on the context, but both are actually valid depending on the context. Right. Yeah, it depends if it's a if it's a JavaScript or just an HTML attribute, then you have to put the at in front of the value. Okay, so there's my red point. And it's pretty small. Woohoo! Success. I did draw. <laughs> if you go south, we find my house. <laughs> oh, was that was that in California or where was? Yeah, that? it is Malibu. So like I'm. Oh, I'm yeah. Personally. I think that's where Esri's headquarters are. So that a lot. Of oh there. wow! Okay. Okay. Uh, that's just north. That's of, really right on the coast of LA. I think. Wow. Um, we had we had another question in the chat I wanted to address before we wrap things up for today. I don't know, pop that up. Um, the viewer says, I had a glimpse at the samples page to see if you can use your own image as a map, but found nothing. Is it easy to do, is it easy to do assuming I have a map, say, in leaflet format? Um, you know, I'm not sure off the top of my head how easy it is. I do believe there's... Um, that there's a way to get leaflet into ArcGIS and of course, and then GeoBlazer. Uh, but that is something I can look up and maybe, I don't do we have a place to add after the show notes for, for this show? Yeah. yeah, we can update the, like the comments or like the description of the YouTube, cause that's where it'll be okay. on demand for, you know, people to come afterwards. So make yeah. sure you check that out. Yep. Yeah, or you can add a comment to the YouTube video that. Uh, and Tim, yeah, I, know I, you had a, sure. I know you had a slide up. Maybe we should show that. It was the getting started steps. For folks that are just tuning in and missed some of the, the talk, right. this could show you how to ramp up on what was discussed today. Um, yeah, and so we tried to make this as easy as possible. Obviously, you know, you have to have some familiarity with .NET and Blazor. Um, but you're just going to import a NuGet package. You're going to get that API key from Esri from ArcGIS Online um, with a free developer account. And then there's a couple of things that you have to paste in. Uh, and in that, the docs.geoblazer.com slash getting started, there's a, a lot of the details of exactly what you need to copy in. But it was basically like a couple of link tags in index.html, the API key itself, and like that uh, add GeoBlazor uh, in the the services builder. Awesome. Yep. And the example we saw today was showing put the API key in app settings.json. When you deploy to production, just know that there's a better more secure way to do that. It's probably not your app settings JSON file. Uh, consider key vault or an environment variable somewhere, just something other than an easy I did to find see, location. Yeah, I did see Christopher mentioned in there too, this does support OAuth. Uh, ArcGIS has an OAuth uh, service, so you can actually set this up to go up and have you know ArcGIS logins, or you could write your own OAuth with Microsoft or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. and, and set it up that way as well. And then even taking it one step further to, to avoid app settings.json, you'd want to keep that out of source control too, because otherwise people would see it there also. Yes. Yep. I, I use the secrets.json, the yep. user secrets, a lot in development, and that's where most of my API keys go. Awesome. Well, this well, well that doesn't great. work for Blazor Wasm. Sorry. Right. <laughs> that only works for Blazor Server. All right. Well, uh, we are out of time, believe it or not, for today's show. But we want to thank everyone in the audience for all the fantastic questions today. Thank you for uh, tuning in and spending the last hour of your day with us. 
Uh, as a reminder, uh, David kind of alluded to this earlier, this show is recorded. You can find this recording and other great recordings of .NET Live TV streams out at dot.net slash live. Uh, tune in next week. Uh, we'll be joined by guest George Cosmodus. And George will be talking about using Azure Functions to connect to a Cos Cosmos DB uh, database. This episode will be near and dear to my heart because it will also talk about security related topics such as Azure RBAC and managed identity and how those kind of are used in the full end to end experience. Look forward to seeing everyone next week. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.